Hello, um, my name is Alexis Quinn. So today's talk is called The Trouble with Alexis Is. Um, and this is a talk about language of disorder um, and of deficit. So a little bit, you know, about, about who I am. So um, I'm a mother, first and foremost, I've got two children. Um, I used to be a school teacher um, and I've been teaching for goodness, like sort of over 10 years. Um, I'm also autistic an ex-international swimmer and um, I penned a, my memoir called Unbroken which details you know my, my time um, in the mental health system as an autistic person. So you know that's quite a lot of sort of positive if you like normal you know um, stuff about me. So what we're going to talk about today is the impact of language. We're going to talk about I guess really the impact it's had on me and I think that a lot of my experiences are generalizable and you know what it's done um, as I've journeyed I guess um, throughout my life. So we're going to look at how it can have the potential to, to fracture identity I guess to hope kill and also how it kind of inflates risk as well. Today you know I aim to, to heighten um, our awareness of, of the cultural conditioning, influencing the way that we speak about autistic people. And, you know, I want to talk about how the language we use about people that are different impacts us and how we're treated. So this talk will draw our cultural conditioning into the, the full light of consciousness as a key step in breaking its hold on us. So, this is what happened to me. I, I, I shared that first slide with you, um, I guess, to, to look at the sort of positive language that we can have around people. But obviously this side evokes something very different, doesn't it? Let me just move that out of the way for you. Um, crisis hit. I was labelled. But it's weird, you know, because, because the labels that I were given were not to do with... with um, um, uh, when I was swimming or, or in academia, you know, labels of, of perseverance, determination, um, um, incredible focus. Um, instead, when my brother died and I gave birth to my daughter and crisis hit me, the same qualities used to describe me in academia and in sport were completely changed. We no longer talked about perseverance or passion or determination. We talked about obsession. We talked about compulsions. We talked about fixations. We talked about idealizations. All negative, all deficit based. Yet we were talking about the same qualities in me. The very things that I was lauded for when I was young, encouraged to do, and literally put on a pedestal for, were caused, were, 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 considered you know an undesirable part of me that needed to be treated and needed to be cured now this linguistic framing of people talking of them as deficits and not um and not as humans um, um uh, and not as people and, and, and god forbid assets which we do so easily and so often it's really at the heart of how we marginalise people. I'd never felt so awful as when I was helped by professionals, by people that were supposed to care. My future was never so limited. I was never so harmed and my, my well-being was never so broken as when I went into crisis and I, and I, needed, and I needed help. Um, so, so why? Well, my reaction to the grief I was experiencing and the trauma of birth located the problems, problems that I was experiencing in myself. And it didn't look at the collective responsibility that society and the system was having and was influencing on me. And as far as I can, can tell, as far as I can tell, I don't really have an inbuilt problem. If you think back to that first slide of me, I didn't look like somebody with a, with a problem. But you can see in this slide, I really was. And a lot of that is from societal discrimination. So I mentioned that I was autistic. 
Just look at the criteria here used to categorise and describe autistic people. Persistent deficits in social communication. Now, I've been talking to you for a little while now. Would you say that my communication, you know, is, is, has a deficit? Certainly it's different. Certainly it's different. And when I was in units um, and, and when I was in crisis, I was in fact mute, okay? But I was still communicating. I was still communicating, just not in a traditional way. So the language used really to describe this disposition in people is so negative. Have a look down here. Restricted, repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. Most people, most people have that. When I was swimming, were my interests restricted, repetitive patterns of behavior as I swam up and down for five hours a day? No. I was, I was, I was um, um, determined, right? I, was, I had amazing perseverance. I was committed. So this kind of othering that we do to people, this language which we use to describe them, is horrendous. Nobody wants to be disordered. No, nobody wants to, to I, I don't think we even want to set about treating people in this way. Um, but we do, and we try to make them look more normal. My disposition is my disposition. It's an autistic disposition, but it's not a disordered disposition. So at the heart of this is a fundamental lack of acceptance, isn't it? You know, of difference, which, which is actually ingrained in the language which we use. Now, have a look at this. This is what was used to, to detain me. OK, this was the, the section paper. So I suffer from a, a mental disorder, namely ASD and ADHD, unaccompanied by language or intellectual impairment. Um, mark deficits in social emotion and more re reciprocity. You know, lack of empathy, intolerance of others, impaired theory of mind and perspective taking. You know, lack of impaired, right? Deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviours. Difficulty interpreting body language, emotions, low self esteem. Deficits in flexible thinking and behaviour. Rigid and obsessive thinking and behavior, preference for routines, predictable activities. Now, you know, I feel uncomfortable reading this. I feel ashamed. I feel depressed, I feel anxious, I feel embarrassed about these words used to describe me. Now, this is not the basis upon which to build helpful relationships. And I use the word helpful because autism can't be treated. My disposition is my disposition, it's embodied. Now, if people want to really help, they need to establish relationships built on, on, on um, mutual trust, respect, yeah, genuine collaboration. They need, they need to understand the reasons that I'm presenting in the way that I am. But I don't see this happening here. In fact, this recommendation, this opinion argued that I had level three autism, you know, the most severe. Um, and this is the way that I was seen, you see. Now, I and no one else, nobody, easily fits into a medical classification. Many of us can't relate to these terms and the deficits narrative we're forced to assume. So what I want to do is just, just spend a moment and let's just think about using language in a more empowering way. So let's say that I'd, I'd, you know, I'd been admitted to this unit, I needed help, absolutely I needed help. But instead of writing something like this and, and casting me linguistically in this way, which obviously affects the treatment that I receive, let's ask these questions. What is Alexis feeling? What is Alexis needing? Um, uh, what... How do I feel as the professional in response to Alexis? Um, what are my needs behind my feelings as a helper when I'm in Alexis's company? What action or decision could I request Alexis take in the belief that it might help her live more happily? Now notice that, that our responses as a helper to these questions 
reveals a lot about ourselves and our values. We as helpers would be far more vulnerable than if we were to simply use the language of deficit disorder and diagnosis. Because those questions are asking questions about ourselves and putting helpers on equal footing. Whereas questions of diagnosis, deficit and disorder, as you see here, firmly put me down. So when people don't understand me and my fellow autistic, they attribute the confusion to a problem in us. That's what's being done here in this opinion and recommendation. Alexis has communication deficits. People so easily attribute the breakdown in communication to me. Yet when I was in hospital, I was communicating very clearly. I didn't have a deficit in communication. I just wasn't speaking. We need people to start owning their own problems. It's you as the helpers that, that maybe don't understand us. So what you could say is, Alexis, I'm confused. I'd like to see the connection between what I've said and your response, but I don't. Would you be willing to explain how your communication relates to what I've just said? Now, I would have understood that request. Okay, I've, I've written that dialogue, you know, to, to meet my needs. I might not have been able to have had at that time a pleasant chit chat with you, but I could certainly have communicated what it was to help you understand. So what I'm saying is helpers need to search a little bit harder and listen a little bit differently and think about their role in language. The point is this, when people let go of the medical narrative, the deficit narrative, and instead stay connected to what was happening for me, the results were positive. When I fled to Africa, I was on a section three and I, I fled the country. Police were chasing me, helicopters, goodness knows what else, you'd think I was a fugitive. But anyway, I digress. When, when I fled to Africa, people connected with me, not knowing my history, not knowing my diagnosis, and weren't flooded with, 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 with um, hurtful language uh, to describe me. They looked at the real me. They saw a human that had needs, and they built positive relationships, and I flourished. Within six weeks of my escape, I was working again as a teacher in a prestigious British curriculum school. Because you see, human growth happens when individuals meet on an equal level and express themselves vulnerably and authentically. This type of relationship rarely exists for many autistics because we are done to and we are not done with. Authenticity is the prerequisite of growth. For autistics to grow and blossom, we need to feel equal. We need to, to be viewed equally. And the way that we're viewed is influenced by the way that people talk about us. This is the hospital treatment that I received. This was what happened to me. I was taken from my family, from my home. I was detained for being autistic. There's no treatment, as I say, for autism. In hospital, I was encouraged through positive behavioural support and behaviourist methods to, you know, stop doing the things which made me look different and to start doing things that made me fit in. Now, it's interesting to me that I didn't need to fit in when I was doing things that society valued. Society only had a problem with me when I was no longer seen as useful or productive in their eyes. Anyway, I digress. Anyway, um, so positive behavioural support. It sounds good, right? Especially that bottom left picture down there. Stop being autistic, stop being autistic. Um, altering my disposition, great idea. So what did that lead to? Well, that, that led to a lot of, of masking, didn't it? You know, I, I was taught um, um, compensatory strategies and behaviours to, to, to mask my autism-related cognitive differences. Um, and, and, and what are we talking about here? We're talking about perhaps simming, uh, stimming, self-soothing behaviour, um, um, an intense love for certain subjects, um, and, and, and my challenging behaviour, you know, running a lot. Um, um, you know, I used to roll down the corridor. Sure, it, it bruised my back a bit, but, you know, I felt better. Did I need to be restrained for that? Hmm. Yeah, and I was considered, you know, one of the lucky ones because I was high-functioning enough to use these compensatory behaviours in response to um, 
I guess the systemic pressures, you know, to, to the pressure to act more normal, basically. I was given a star chart. Yeah, when I did something good, I got a star. If I collected enough stars, I got to go outside. Now, the idea is laudable. Yes, I get that. You know, we need to fit into a certain degree. We need to, to kind of, you know, function as effectively as possible. Um, but this compensation, it's a euphemism for coercion. It teaches us to adopt and to generate new behaviours to avoid negative outcomes. Negative outcomes, you know, which, 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 which workers and helpers and carers and so on inflicted on me, inflicted on us, by the way. So to increase opportunities given to us by people with more power than us, to help us meet society's expectations of behaviour. The issue with this, well, it focuses on outward behaviour, doesn't it? And doesn't look at what all this modification is doing to the emotional well-being and impact it's having on our love and respect for ourselves. So despite plenty of research indicating the negative impact of this on our well-being, you know, it's gold standard, I, I craved praise the odd reward, you know, of um, getting to go outside and eat my favourite food. Um, but I couldn't always meet the expectations and I'd feel like such a failure. And that had a severe impact, you know, on my mental health and well-being. You know, there isn't a problem with teaching people how to, how to fit in as long as it's led by the person, it's not forced. But the fact that we even think this is okay is because of the way language and society casts us that we constantly need to improve and be better. You know, um, notice, you know, when I, I talk in this way, it reveals very little about what's going on in the praise giver. And instead, you know, it focuses instead on the autistic person. It establishes the speaker as someone who sits in judgment. This is what the language does. And judgments can be both positive and negative. Judgments which imply rightness and wrongness. These are life changing. They're life alienating ways of communicating. And as I've already explained that, you know, sure there's lots of evidence about the immediate impact of phrase, of praise, you know, which, which has on behavior. In the short term, in the short term, people usually do respond to praise and to compliments. But, but research has shown that in the long time, this type of behaviour modification it doesn't impact well on people. And the thing is, the beauty of gratitude and the way that we talk to autistic people, especially those in crisis, especially children, is, 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 you know, is, is to celebrate, to genuinely celebrate and not just reinforce behaviour to get something in return. It makes us feel anxious and crappy when we don't meet your expectations. So let me ask you this. What about teaching people to adapt to us? Just a little bit. A radical idea, I know. You know, what about telling us that we're perfect just the way that we are? And to love our uniqueness and to create plans with us that connect with us on a deep level, to communicate autistically and to listen with more than just your ears. What about meeting us halfway? And what about not expecting us to make all the adjustments? You know, you know don't let autism define you, they said to me in hospital. But it does define me. It does define me. And, and saying that really sort of makes me feel crappy because it's more than a diagnosis for autism, isn't it? You know, it's a way of being. It's not something that I suffer from. It's a disposition. Yes, there's lots of traits that were very dis disabling at times. You know, I spent three and a half years in hospital. I was restrained 97 times. I was secluded. I was long-term segregated. I know the impact of autism, but actually it wasn't autism. It wasn't autism. It was a model of difference which doesn't celebrate diversity, but shuns it. And we know from the social model of disability that this is largely because the world isn't designed for me and my fellow autistics. Where I was kept was sensory charged. It aggravated this sensory system. This isn't just my brain up here. My brain 
is, is all of this, all of this neurology is autistic. The whole structure of me is autistic. It's an inextricable part of me. It defines me, every aspect of my existence. So without being autistic, I'm not the person that I am. So don't tell me that it shouldn't define me. And people say that, why? Because they see it as something negative. Because the language around it, autism, is, a, is disease ridden, you know, something to be eradicated. But that separation, that encouraging, that separation is so damaging. You know, detained for autism, treated for autism, a person with autism, like I'm broken, like I've got no chance of getting better because it's neurological. It hope kills. It hope kills. So I grew to hate the part of myself which was autistic, which was basically all of me, the part that was wrong, that I was told was wrong, all the disorders I had. Why? Why did I hate it? Because I was taught to hate it. I didn't hate it when I was a swimmer. I didn't hate it when I was getting my first class honours degree. In fact, I'd never hated autism or Alexis Quinn until I was helped to hate myself by professionals because I was put at odds with myself. I was told to focus on the part of me which was broken and needed to be overcome. So I was at a constant war with myself, which I could never win because, you know, we can't change all of this. So I understand that nobody went to work to make me feel that way. But this is what language does, isn't it? And it's insidious. It permeates our culture. And it led to, to it leads to mental health problems. Have a look at these statistics here. Is it surprising that one in three autistics experience severe mental health? That two thirds have felt suicidal? and one third have felt so bad that they've attempted suicide. According to these stats down here, I've only got a few years left to live. And look at these. This is what happens to autistic people because of the way that we talk about them and the way that we cast them in society. Us, them, disorder, deficit, impairment. You know, when what is expected of us isn't our own, what we want for ourselves, it's, it's the goals of society. For example, for me to access the community, Right, Alexis has to access the community. This is what I earn with my star chart. I don't want to go there. That's what it looked like for me. That was my reward, was to go out into a sensory charged environment. I was pushed to manage this environment, which isn't conducive to me. Of course, I'd react autistically and I'd melt down. Then I'd failed and I'd be punished. But on our reactions, normal aren't they to be expected why did i have to go to the supermarket i wish the people you know that, that that had worked with me had asked are the goals for alexis things she actually wants or are they the same goals that we have for non-autistic people imposed on her because of a set of ideals things that we think everybody should be able to do and this is how i grew up and this is what happened to me again in hospital. And I say to you, gently encourage, don't force. When I was in hospital, I was a level three autism. They wanted me to be a level two and then a level one, somebody that wasn't quite as disordered as when they first went in. But my neurology doesn't change. So what are our goals? And whose goals are they? Do the team goals or the family goals for your autistic loved ones and people include happiness? Do they include creativity and the ability to choose a safe path if they want to? Do the goals include socialising autistically, sharing lives with autistic peers, being able to focus deeply? Or are you ramming a square peg into a round hole, making no progress, but just damaging that peg? 
I think what we need to do, you know, is to is to think about this autistic orbit. You know, I, this this is a great analogy because you know everyone kind of is is um, orbiting the sun, right? But this autistic orbit, which is Pluto, you know, Pluto's got a slightly different orbit, and it's valid in its own right. The orbit's fine. It's fine. What we need to do though is to support that orbit. Because most of the reports written about me and the goals I was supposed to achieve, where there's a long list of deficits that I needed to celebrate correcting, you know, narratives about risk reduction, you know, portraying me really as, as a danger, basically, to be controlled. And, and we need to think, don't we, about how we can make the reports and the goals for our people, you know, full of care, joy and positivity and hope and have bigger aspirations. Because... It's, it's these things and the language around these things which, which, which enable better mental health. Let's not make our loved ones a statistic. And good communication, the language we use is one way. And, and I can tell you that as an inpatient, there was no, no effort made to enable authentic language and communication. You know, but look, we can only do this if we think about people differently. And, and that starts, doesn't it, with using and thinking about more enabling language to identify, to love and to care for our unique, fabulous people. Because we need to hear, we, we need people to hear our, our pain, you know, that's caused by how people and society talks about us, yet the damage that it's doing. Um, and we, we, need, we need you guys to reflect back to those paragraphs written about me, those ones at the very, very start earlier, and hear and feel what I felt when I read those sentences to you, the shame, the embarrassment, because we need to use language that tells autistic people to be proud of themselves, that they are enough and that they have strengths. We may feel awkward deviating from the status quo in the way that we speak. So take your time. But, you know, if your intention is, is to truly live life in harmony with how we feel about autistic people, then, we, you know, we're going to want to take our time, aren't we? And to think about, you know, what, what terms we're using to describe our loved ones. Because when I see autism, autism you know, I see, I see a disposition, I see, I see a culture, I see, I see something beautiful. I see people desperately wanting acceptance. Um, I see platforms being built which allow autistic people to speak for themselves, you know, so the, the world can see the remarkable insights that we have and our talents and, and are better able to, to nurture us and enable us to contribute positively. So when I speak of, you know, I guess autism defining me, it's, it's that definition really that, that I'm talking about. Because obviously when we're proud, we can, we can speak for ourselves, can't we, in a way that, that's, that's most comfortable. So I guess we need to use language which encourages people to feel pride, um, to let autistic folk know by the way that we talk about them, that they are valued and that they do matter. And, and you know, it, it, it took me um, years to stop apologising for myself. But, but when I did stop apologising, you know, I felt better and, and, and reassured and um, if you ever read my book, you, you'll see that you're actually very lucky to be alive and, and standing here today. And, you know, I, I was never discharged from section. Um, I, I was never discharged from mental health services. You know, I literally fled the country um, and I'm lucky to have escaped and to, to, to have had those resources to, you know, to, to rebuild my life again. Um, so, so I feel lucky to, to, to be able to stand here basically and tell you, you know, what helped and, 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 and what didn't help. And I'm afraid that we, we really do need to start thinking about the language that we use um, and what, what sort of language is harmful and, and what sort of language is helpful. Um, certainly, I've hoped to have convinced you that, that we need to change the way we talk about autistic people. And hopefully you've got a bit more of the understanding of the impact that that's had on me. And, and likely many other autistic people. The impact's real. Thank you.